So, uh, you know, as, as is in this world of trying to figure things out during a power shutdown, uh, we've had additions and uh, subtractions to our agenda. But what this is really going to focus on, this was going to be uh, information from the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Tim's, uh, what's that? California Geological Survey, sorry, apologize, um, and, uh, is, is obviously earthquakes. We're going to jump into earthquakes. Uh, you know, we've talked about fires, that we have multi-hazards. I'm asking my colleague, uh, Supervisor Rabbit, to join in because he's also on the uh, State Seismic Safety Commission appointed by the governors, uh, originally by Governor Brown, I think, to two different terms. Uh, and so, uh, so what we want to do is let them kind of take us into what's going on. So Tim would love for, and I, I think Supervisor, we have you until about 11. Yeah. So um, maybe you can set the stage in the intro and go into that. And then I'd love, love uh, you know, Supervisor Rabbit to talk about the, the Seismic Safety Commission and whatever you want to do. And then we'll come back and for the last kind of half hour, have you finish up uh, hammering through and also uh, a Q&A &A with anything that's relevant. So. Uh, take it away. So thank you, everyone. I'm, it's my pleasure to be here today. And, and the one thing that's come out of this morning's conversation is I see a lot of commonalities between fire and earthquakes. Um, one being is that fires often happen after earthquakes. We know that from 1906 in San Francisco. Um, and the other thing we do is, you know, the, the preparation, the response and the recovery you also have a lot of commonalities. And so I'm from the California Geological Survey. A lot of what we do is mitigation products, and we take a lot of applied science, turn it into some products I'm going to talk about this morning, and provide that to you, the counties, the cities, other stakeholders within, within California. So I always like to throw up this slide. California is earthquake country. Each one of these red dots represents an earthquake of some size in California during the last 30 years or so. Each one of the black lines is a known fault in California, and this isn't including the faults that we don't know about. Um, and so if you just take a little tour around the state, you can go on a circuit from Orange County to Mono County to Butte County to Humboldt County back down to Sonoma. There's almost nowhere in the state that hasn't been affected by earthquakes since the state you know, was founded in 1849 or whatever it is. In California, there's a number of seismic hazards that are regulated in some form. Um, the first one is, of course, strong ground shaking. That's mostly dealt with the California Building Code um, and other laws such as the Field Act, which applies to schools. Um, my personal area of um, expertise is surface fault rupture mapping. Um, and that's covered under the Alquist Priolo Earthquake Fault Zoning Act. Um, you can see up here, I don't know if this, yeah, this on the upper right here, that's an example from the Landers earthquake in 1992 of surface fault rupture. Um, it kind of nicked this little house right there with the trailer in it. This is a very localized hazard, but has significant impacts if your building happens to be located on top of that fault. Um, we have liquefaction throughout California, wherever there's areas of strong ground motion and um, high water table and certain geologic conditions such as loose sediment. Um, this is an example from the marina in San Francisco after 1989, um, the Loma Prieta earthquake. Again, it caused structural collapse of this building, a lot of impacts to local utilities because pipes are often located underground and if liquefaction happens, those pipes can break. And then um, we have earthquake-induced landslides. Here's another example from Loma Prieta. Um, unlike f in, during the winter time, if you know there's been a lot of rain and then there's an earthquake, that's something that we might expect after an earthquake, especially in wetter areas of California, such as the North Bay. Um, if there was an earthquake on the nearby Rogers Creek fault, we and during the springtime, perhaps we'd expect a lot of landslides to also impact the area. And then finally, um, we have tsunamis. And this is also covered by the Seismic Hazards Mapping Act in terms of what we do at the California Geological Survey. This is um, a tsunami in Santa Cruz Harbor after the uh, Tohoku earthquake in 2010, I believe. Um, caused widespread damage to infrastructure up and down the coast. So 
Some of the products we'd have is that we're partners with the USGS, the Southern California Earthquake Center, um, the California Earthquake Authority, which is an insurance provider in California, provides money to this effort. We do earthquake rupture forecasts. And so um, one of our big products are these rupture forecasts. Um, this one's called USURF 3 for the Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast. It's version three of this. Um, this is probabilities of earthquakes throughout California. And so when you hear these, these statistics, they're often quoted by the USGS and the California Geological Survey about, say, in the Bay Area, there's a 70, about a 70% chance of a major earthquake that's a magnitude 6, 7 or above in the next 30 years. This is the study that's done that synthesizes all the available science within the state um, on faults and just general earthquake science and our knowledge of how we assess those hazards into these earthquake probability forecasts. These are in turn fed into the USGS National Seismic Hazard um, map, which is a forecast of earthquake shaking throughout the country, and especially California. You can see California here on this map is very red because we expect, due to the number of faults and the activity of the faults in California, um, just very high hazard related to earthquakes. My, my division within the California Geological Survey is mostly focused on making these seismic ground failure zonation maps. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm mostly involved with fault mapping throughout the state, and that's covered under the Alquist Priola Earthquake Fault Zoning Act. Um, pertains to surface fault rupture. We, we map the faults in detail. We establish these zones that required investigation. Um, my colleagues at CGS also are involved with local faction in seismically induced landslide and tsunami inundation zone maps shown here on the right. Um, these maps are produced as these earthquake zones or required investigation maps. This is a map that shows all these hazards um, for a certain area in Hayward, California. We have these maps throughout the state. Some areas have not been mapped yet, but they're available on our website. Um, we usually provide these to you, our stakeholders, as GIS files for your GIS staff to use and integrate into your, your planning, things like um, city plans, uh, emergency response plans, and planning departments. The main issue with these, these maps is that it triggers an investigation. So before a project goes in for development, um, there has to be some sort of fault or a geologic investigation that it's aimed at identifying whether the hazard exists here on a, on a development property. And if the hazard exists based on the geologic investigation, then it has to be mitigated in some way, either through avoidance or through some sort of ground improvement program or um, structural design. Um, CGS is also heavily involved in producing these guidance products for stakeholders such as yourselves. Um, for AP Act, we have Special Publication 42, Earthquake Fault Zones in California. Um, we also have a similar product, which is Special Pub 117A for um, liquefaction landslide hazards related to earthquakes. And then finally, we also, for tsunamis, produce these um, playbooks. So these are um, publications. They're designed to be handed out to harbor masters, for example. Um, says, you know, OK, this is an earthquake that's happened. This is what you might expect at your harbor. And this is how you should, it helps guide that response, whether it's evacuating the harbor or just understanding what kind of potential damage can be expected from a tsunami of a certain size. For the public, we also provide this, what we call the EQZ app, which is an online resource. Basically, people can type in to our website their address, find out what kind of hazard zone they're, they're in. Um, easy to find if you just Google EQZ app in California Geological Survey. Some other products we have, we have landslide databases, geologic maps. Um, related to some of the discussion this morning is that we have landslide and fires up there that we're working on. Um, we have a program that actually goes out and does post-fire um, assessments for debris flows, things like that. Um, all this can be found in our information warehouse. So related to earthquakes, I think the good news is that in California, we're getting better and better in terms of structures. They're resistant to earthquakes. A lot of this is regulated by building code. 
Um, wood framed homes, which don't do so well during fires, are actually exceptionally resistant to earthquake damage in terms of being structurally sound. Um, you can always expect a lot of damage inside with contents, but um, within the building itself, you know, you'll be able to hopefully reoccupy that building after an earthquake. The building codes get better all the time. And then, you know, California has a lot of highly trained engineers and contractors that are getting better and better at building these types of structures resistant to earthquake damage. Again, there's a lot of retrofit programs in California. Um, there's actually some programs that are um, incentive programs. One is the Brace and Bolt program, which is funded by the California Earthquake Authority. It basically helps ho homeowners defray the cost of, whoops, um, doing basic retrofits, such as bolting down their foundations, which is one of the things for older homes that is probably the most effective. And then, um, you know, we spent billions of dollars in California retrofitting freeways and bridges. Another resource for local folks such as yourself is earthquakecountry.org. Um, this provides some resources. Um, it's a group, it's a nonprofit group that can help you, you know, be better prepared for earthquakes. Well, thank you, Tim. I'm gonna, we're going to pass it over to Supervisor Rabbit. Well, thank you, Tim, uh, for being here, and thanks for that presentation. We are lucky in California to have some just great um, scientific uh, folks that work on our behalf that put together uh, information like this that we should all take advantage of and make sure that it gets distributed uh, far and wide. I, I was going to say, if you really want to know your own faults, uh, just get married. <laughs> That's what I thought about when you were saying you still don't know our faults. Well... <laughs> Some of us get them pointed out often. Um, the one thing that I, I think uh, with the conversation we had earlier regarding the fires, uh, the one thing that is true, while the fires are hell on earth and uh, an incredible uh, thing to go through, if you think about the fires that we had here in Sonoma County, it have truly affected, burnt through 110,000 acres. If you have a, a, a significant earthquake, it is going to be widespread. And so it changes the response, I believe, and, and what we need to do and how we would do that. And I think we all need to be aware of that going forward. Um, I, was in, uh, I was in Sausalito in 1989, the Loma Prieta, and I was on a, a building that was built in 1898, made of brick that was unreinforced, on uh, 12 feet from San Francisco Bay. And uh, we always used to point out along the brick wall, it was an architect's office, I'm an architect, so it was actually aesthetically very pleasing. Of course, uh, structurally it was a disaster, because uh, we'd always point out, right, this uh, crack that was about six feet off the finished floor, that was where, in 1906, that's where the top of the building fell off, and they rebuilt it, and you can see the different color uh, brick. When that earthquake struck that day, I was in the office, uh, we had just turned on the uh, World Series game, and um, you could not see within the building because of the uh, dust from the uh, mortar in the building. And I actually was going to jump into the bay, um, came this close, and decided that I would wait. Uh, and when we went down the stairs, I think, in, actually in Marin, uh, since our door was about 14 feet high, uh, again, the architecture, uh, uh, some bricks had fallen on a couple of German tourists. And I think they might have been the, uh, it was a bloody mess. It was ugly. Uh, and they might have been the only ones injured on the Loma Prieta earthquake in Marin County that particular day. The reason I bring that up is that, you know, the remembering the damage that occurred then and the response that we put out. The other thing that I would say about our fires here locally and kind of the comparison of that to earthquakes, the other day when we did our anniversary, we had some numbers, some stats and whatnot, and I'm sure this is probably true in Butte County as well. I had to go back and double check what staff had told us because they said there was 50, almost 57,000 first responders uh, showed up in Sonoma County. 57,000. That's an incredible number. And again, what happens in an earthquake, if you can imagine the Bay Area being struck by widespread damage, uh, you're, you're going to have a fraction of that. Um, so I, I do think that that's important that we make sure um, uh, we deal with that accordingly. It's just going to be different. Um, and so it, it doesn't mean it can't uh, also work as well, but it's going to be different. I, I would say the other thing, the things that I learned on over the course of time, especially in I could tell you in San Francisco, for instance, where I did a lot of my work, the building codes did change uh, at a, as a result of 1989. They used to be, you used to be able to concentrate more lateral loads, earthquake loads, in smaller areas, and then they wanted them now more distributed throughout the buildings. Uh, and that's, uh, these things continue to evolve. Our building codes are, I would say, the best around, the best in the United States, which is the best in the world. 
because they are specific to California. They take into account all these different issues, especially on the earthquake side. Um, at the same time, building codes are, especially if you're not an essential building, and essential buildings are typically hospitals, firehouses, police stations, emergency, you know, the things that we want to make sure schools, uh, if your home is built to the latest building code, it is built to provide you life, uh, fire safety. It doesn't mean necessarily that after a strong earthquake that you could re-inhabit your home. And uh, I always point to the people, uh, when Napa had the earthquake and you saw that picture of that one building on the corner that was a reinforced building and the, the corner had fallen off, that building was built to code and actually performed the way the code said it would. The, the uh, bricks fell out, not in. The, if you're in the building, you were safe, you can get out. Doesn't mean that you could re-inhabit re that building. I can tell you stories of uh, through the Seismic Safety Commission, we have this great engineer who travels the world after earthquakes, uh, Kit Miyamoto, and uh, brings back reports from those particular locations, and the same thing is true there. You can imagine building codes elsewhere where, yeah, the, the best of building codes will allow you to get out, but doesn't necessarily mean that that building uh, can be inhabited afterwards. And this came to light um, in San Francisco when the Millennium Building or Millennium Tower was starting to lean, and can you imagine what would happen in San Francisco if uh, a very severe earthquake on liquefaction uh, took the foundations of buildings like that and had them uh, lean to a, an extent that you now have to go back and have a uh, controlled demolition, um, blocking off areas going forth, and uh, so it's interesting. The State Seismic Safety Commission is really all about making sure that we're prepared, that there's an awareness. Uh, working with our science partners, doing some research, doing uh, projects that we get out there, the great shakeout and all those kind of things. Uh, the response is really up to the local entities, although there's always um, uh, room uh, for co collaboration. And then really talking about uh, recovery. I just saw an article in the San Francisco Chronicle that talked about the power outage this week in California as being as much as $1 billion economic impact. So you can imagine what the economy, what would happen to the economy, the billions of dollars uh, if California was shut down for an extended period of time. And there's a lot of different, um, we've looked at a lot of different agri uh, sectors, including agriculture, about what would ha how would you get food to market uh, if things were really, went to hell in a handbasket and, and a lot of the infrastructure was uh, uh, damaged. And those are important things that we just need to kind of keep working at. Uh, again, you know, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of great old buildings out there uh, that may or may not perform as we want them to, to make sure that everyone's, uh, everyone is safe, but how we respond, what we just keep the uh, awareness going forward, because again, it's cliche, but it is not a matter of if, but just when, and um, we're, we're getting there. They, the fire cameras that actually are being distributed through Sonoma County really came out of the um, earthquake early warning system uh, as we tried to get that up and running uh, throughout California. There was a pilot program going on when the Napa earthquake uh, struck, and I believe the city of Vallejo uh, at the fire department had a nearly two-second uh, warning, which is uh, obviously very short, but it is enough for the door to start going up, uh, which is important because there are a lot of firehouses where if you can't get the fire engine out of the firehouse because the door is skewed within the frame, uh, there's uh, nothing else you can do. So the early earthquake warning system, the more sensors we have, the better. We uh, understand, you know, we took advantage of the fires and, and, and to get funding for fire cameras, but, but the same technology, having a sensor in the ground beneath that and having, feeding it back in the, same, um, in the same way can give us another piece of information, another piece of uh, another uh, sensor that you can triangulate, and the more sensors we have throughout the state of California, the better off we will be. Japan has had these for years, Mexico and Mexico City has had these, but yet California has lagged behind. Uh, we do have some uh, funding, uh, but you know it's always a matter of resources. So with that, I'll go back to Tim, or questions, whatever you want to do, Tim. Just for clarity, uh, tell people what liquefaction is. Liquefaction is um, when Sediment that's very loose, sand, for, for example, that's saturated water. It actually, in, in a normal circumstance, it's, it's a solid. However, when you impact it with strong shaking from an earthquake, it actually behaves more like a liquid. That becomes an issue if your building is actually, foundation is situated in that, in that 
geologic body, so to speak. And so you can lose bearing capacity for your building, the building can tilt, um, the building can collapse depending on how, how it's built. Um, there's some great photos from Japan in the 1960s of buildings that just toppled like do dominoes due to liquefaction. You know, we had a, a presentation to our Board of Supervisors um, on the threat of, and I'd encourage any of you from different counties or different agencies to have like what we've been doing is quarterly uh, hazard workshops until you're comfortable with, where, with what the information is. Uh, we started with a flood. Uh, workshop at the beginning of the year uh, when Supervisor Rabbit took over as chair. Just so happens we had a flood a month later. Also, it just so happens that our leads on flood management said it was the first time that they had been to able to not just present items to our board, but a comprehensive discussion around flood management in Sonoma County since 1997. Let me repeat that. Imagine that we all go through and have consent calendar and regular calendar items that are vitally important, but we never had, we hadn't had a comprehensive discussion about how we respond to flooding between our board and our staff and the variety of response mechanism folks for 20 years, right? So on the earthquake side, it was fascinating. One of your colleagues from the USGS, US Geological Survey came and he showed us an animation, a simulation of basically the connection of the Rogers Creek Fault, which runs through here, right where you are, so thank you for joining us in the fault land, and, um, and connects with the Hayward Fault. And really, when you looked at that simulation, there was a couple things. One is, is that it showed you that, um, first of all, that anything that hits anywhere on that fault is going to connect up and down, just like as if there was a stream, to differing levels. And you can tell me what, uh, you know, how wrong I am and how I'm trying to relay this, but it, what it showed us in Sonoma County is we got 72 hours on our own, <laughs> is what it showed us. So that's the first thing you gotta realize, and you're just like, okay, now I can plan off of that. We're gonna have to tell everybody we, got, we need 72 hours before mutual aid arrives, because the Bay Area is gonna be so impacted by what's going on that there isn't gonna be support up here. So we need to have that kind of redundancy and resilience at our level. The second thing that was shocking to me was not it was how far the waves actually travel and how 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 much you can still have liquefaction affects uh, a wide geography away from where the actual fault is. So first question to you is off of what I'm saying is any of that stuff from a from a real practical standpoint for those of us who are not earthquake gurus that you could share? Yeah on your last point it's very true that you can have a very distant earthquake. Those seismic waves can come in, cause liquefaction at, at very long distances. And we know that from Loma Prieta in 1989. The earthquake was actually in the Santa Cruz Mountains, you know, maybe 90 miles away from San Francisco. Is that the epicenter in the Santa yeah, Cruz Mountains? Yeah, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And a lot of the damage was in Oakland, impacted the Cypress freeway structure, which collapsed. Um, that was also in an area prone to liquefaction, as well as the marina. Mm -hmm. where um, you know, we saw firsthand after that earthquake that you have buildings collapse, that rupture gas mains, they catch on fire. Um, the marina was basically saved because San Francisco has a fire boat that's equipped to run a pump, and so they can pump seawater in, help fight the fires. And so the boat's appropriately named the Phoenix, um, and that was part of their emergency response plan is to use these fire boats to help pump water into their firefighting system. Wow, fascinating. Um, uh, question, yeah. Consequence of a, of a major earthquake in either the LA Basin or, or the Bay Area is, is gonna be enormous. Uh, and I think in particular, it's gonna have far reaching effects because it affects the economy of the whole state. Um, it, that becomes a statewide issue. And so the question is, what's your feeling from the commission standpoint as to the level of awareness of uh, legislature and governor's office in terms of the need to put resources into mitigating and recovering from that? Well, I mean, you know, obviously, are there ever enough resources right. available? And I think that always comes down to that. You're absolutely right. I mean, um, the numbers are staggering, uh, depending on how, you know, California, what, being the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, if business is closed in any major metropolitan area or, or in a wide uh, swath of the state, it's going to have a significant impact and roll through really the entire world. 
that's why it's so important to make sure that we can get things back up and running. I will say that, again, like our building codes, I think that we are as pre pre prepared today as, um, I won't say as we can be, because just like with our fires, you could always, it's always more and more and more right. awareness. And, of, and we have and, old building stock that yeah. has not been treated. Yeah. Um, so it, do I think that people are aware of the issue? Yeah. Do I think they understand, you know, if, if there's a massive earthquake on one of the major faults and the consequences thereafter, it's going to be all hands on deck uh, to really try to get things up and running and uh, back to yeah. some semblance of normal as quickly as possible. It is going to be a, a massive undertaking. I think the more that we can do it at the local level, um, on the countywide, you know, if, if we can cobble together the 58 counties to be much more prepared, I think that obviously the state as a whole is going to be much that much better. So that's why, again, uh, you, this week is an important week to make sure at least you, uh, if you're in earthquake country, right. uh, just, you know, just make sure that you're doing issue. everything that you can right. uh, going forward. Yeah. And then, I, I don't know, Tim, if you had something, but then the, maybe this one comes to you. Um, at, a, at a very personal level of individuals, uh, the early warning system is installed now and providing some amount of, of uh, short-term warning. People need to be prepared to react uh, appropriately. But there's also been uh, some interesting work on predicting earthquakes. And th that's long, you know, for 50 years been the desire of seismologists to be able to, to say that, you know, within, within days or weeks that we can ex have a reasonable expectation of, of, a, of a large earthquake. I, I guess to me the public policy issue is how are we doing on making people confident of the predictions? Uh, you know, we have a problem of, of uh, issuing false false alarms, and we have a problem of not issuing alarms when we should have. And how how do you feel that 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 human personal level of uh, work is going? That that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, in terms of earthquake prediction, we're still nowhere near being able to predict earthquakes with any level of confidence, if at all. Um, and whenever you see someone out there in the media saying predicting, you know, they're going to predict an earthquake, you know, you have to take a, a lot of caveats that they're probably not able to do that right now. Um, what we focus in on is forecasting. And there's two different flavors of forecasting. There's the long-term forecast, which I showed, which is USERF, their 30-year forecast. Those are really aimed at, you know, providing us with some information about where to focus, you know, improvements to the building code um, and mitigation efforts, things like that, because, you know, the Hayward Fault ruptures every hundred and, you know, 50 years or so. It's been that long since. That's where we sort of expect. Same with the Rogers Creek Fault. It's been a long time since there's been a major earthquake there on the Rogers Creek Fault, focusing on that. Um, and then there's short-term forecasting, which the USGS is heavily involved with. And, you know, there's a lot of statistics that say that if you have a, an earthquake of a certain size, there's a st statistical probability of that being followed up by a larger earthquake at some very low probability level, but it's a real, it's a real probability, or it's a real hazard. And so we learned this this summer in Ridgecrest. On July 4th, there was a magnitude 6.4 earthquake that happened um, just outside of Ridgecrest. The USGS produced some probability aftershocks. It was a very small probability. It might have been only like 10%, maybe even less, of that 6.4 being followed by a larger earthquake. And a little over 24 hours later, there was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake. Um, so I think we are getting some confidence about our ability to forecast earthquakes, but what the public does with very small probability numbers is, that's a difficult question. They're, they're really hard to understand, even as a scientist, you know, after that earthquake, I was looking at it going like, oh, what's this mean? Is there going to be a larger earthquake? Is there going to be a significant earthquake after this magnitude 6.4? And, you know, I didn't really have the answers, but, you know, the... The nice thing that happened after this earthquake is that the USGS, along with CGS, were deployed to Ridgecrest. Um, Ken Hudnett at the USGS actually gave a briefing to the mayor, to the police chief there, that there was a possibility that there could be a larger earthquake 
soon after what had just happened on July 4th, and that was information that the emergency managers in Ridgecrest actually could use, and it helped them plan whether they were going to keep their emergency operations center open, keep staff on call, things like that. What about earthquake weather? and animal predictors. And I mean that, no, why, why people still say that? I got a text from a very rational, sane person who I know in my community who says, you know, James, uh, I'm just sending you a text. Feels like earthquake weather. What do you think? I'm like, let me get back to you. Um, I mean, just in a heartbeat, tell me something. <laughs> What's your empirical analysis of animal prediction of earthquake? Uh, it, it's the probability? same as anyone that, you know, predicting earthquakes, there's basically no evidence to show that animals or, you know, as much as I'd like the cat, you know, or dog to predict an earthquake for us, you know, what, what people do see a lot of times, and I've experienced this ourselves with one of our dogs in the past, is that they're, they're able to feel the P wave, that initial wave of the earthquake hit, and if the earthquake's far enough away, they'll react to it, you won't feel it, and then you'll feel the shaking. And so, you know, you get, might get a few seconds. It's basically the same concept that earthquake early warning works. I have a quick question, kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, and before uh, David has to go, um, kind of more on the policy side, but related to some of the fire issues we're talking about. After some of our major earthquakes in California, um, folks got together and realized they had a significant insurance issue and created the California Earthquake Authority, um, and there, are, there have been a lot of parallels drawn to the situation we're in now uh, with insurance related to fire and um, disasters of that nature. Um, just from your perspective, um, I guess David, but then also uh, Tim, are it, it's a bit different. Uh, are there lessons to be learned from the earthquake authority that we can um, translate into some of the other disasters in California and the insurance challenges that we're facing? That will be a huge insurance challenge uh, with an earthquake. Uh, typically, earthquake insurance is, has a very high deductible, covers, um, you may or may not cover as we find with the fires, uh, what what we would consider replacement costs. I would say the the one um, upside of an earthquake, as opposed to certainly with our wildfires, which rarely damaged a building, only burnt them to the ground uh, with everything inside. Obviously, an earthquake is going to destroy a building in a different way, um, and that's why I think it's really important to uh, put put money up front into making sure your home is is uh, bolted to the foundation, is braced, that your foundation is adequate, uh, that you have some sort of lateral bracing within your home. Again, wood, wood homes in California will do very well with a, quite frankly, a very strong earthquake. You may, uh, more often than not, what happens with earthquakes and to the inhabitants is all the um, uh, furnishings and things inside uh, will fall and, and hurt you, less so your building actually collapsing on you. I think if you go back and look at the last so many earthquakes, Napa uh, brings this to mind. Uh, it's unreinforced masonry chimneys and fireplaces. Uh, it's front porches that aren't necessarily uh, designed and attached to the building as strong as they should be. Certainly there's buildings that will jump off a foundation, and again, that goes to bracing, bolting. There are things that you can do to make sure that if there's a uh, significant earthquake that your home is going to be habitable, and that if there is damage, it's within a smaller dollar amount that perhaps might be more manageable. Still understanding that there's going to be folks who are going to be displaced. Um, it's larger buildings uh, that, again, you know, and, and we've had this discussion at the uh, State Seismic Safety Commission. And I'm there as a local government rep. And I remember when Governor Brown appointed me now twice, it was really to uh, make sure you bring that perspective and make sure that we really have a deliberative process of if we were to change the building code and say that we want to essentially have all buildings uh, you know, designed to that essential level so that uh, not only will they be habitable uh, or they'll be habitable as well as um, still standing after an earthquake, the debate is really about how much would that cost. Uh, and, and around here, I mean, it, it will cost a certain amount and, and are people willing to go in that direction? It, it, it all depends. I will tell you that if you're... Um, if, if your home is a typical two-story home and there's room within the uh, type of construction per the building code and the occupancy uh, to increase the size or uh, the uh, 
uh, the lateral resistance of that home may not cost you a lot. But there are other, I can tell you, like in San Francisco, if you have to change from, for instance, a, uh, a wooden building to a steel building or concrete lower floor, uh, you know, non-ductile, uh, it'll cost you considerably. And then you weigh that against what we have in California, which is essentially a housing crisis, and we're trying to make sure that we can get people in homes and not having them be prohibitively expensive. Um, it kind of goes to the discussions that we were all seemingly having about reach codes uh, on top of uh, the latest and greatest new uh, building codes coming forward. Tim? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that from personal experience, living in San Francisco, I live in a condo-like association, homeowners association, and we went through this process of actually spending money on the retrofit. And for us, I mean, it was not a trivial thing. We're on a hillside, um, we have a soft first story, and it was upwards of, you know, $150,000 to do all the work just to get to the, the city's mandated minimum for what we did. And fortunately, we were able to spread that amongst 10 owners or so. But, uh, you know, after going through this process, um, actually, the interesting thing about this was that we, because of a loophole in the city code, we were actually exempt from doing our retrofit. <laughs> and it's just because, because of the weird construction of our building. But we have the same problems. We had a soft first story, we're on a hill, we have, you know, we're cantilevered out. Um, it took me personally a lot of effort to educate the other homeowners in our HOA to go ahead and spend that money. And at the end of it, I think everyone feels like it was money well spent, even though it's sort of this abstract concept that there's an earthquake that could damage our building. Well, yeah, and I know that um, I was gonna mention too, through my um, work, and I'm finishing up a two-year stint as president of the Bay Area Association of Counties, we've also had some resiliency discussions there. Talking about what San Francisco can do as compared to other locales, including Oakland. Oakland and San Francisco have kind of the same housing stock in, in much of the neighborhoods. San Francisco can, can uh, because of the economic engine that it is, can institute, and I'm glad that you weren't mandatorily required, but there are places that are soft story ordinances that you have to go back and actually redo your soft story, which, which means that you don't have enough wall, essentially, on that uh, frontage, on, usually on the street. You have a garage or some big openings that just don't give you enough uh, substance to hold the building up above it. Um, Oakland wanted to do that, and they couldn't do it because the rent couldn't, uh, it wouldn't get done. The rents were, weren't going to pay for, you know, San Francisco rents are that much higher, uh, and they could afford to do that. My family has buildings in San Francisco, and right now they have, um, and they were built, I actually feel old because I helped build some of them, that are getting retrofitted seismically. Uh, they had open, turns out to be soft stories for parking. Well, since San Francisco is a transit first uh, community, you don't have to have a parking space for each uh, apartment. Um, usually if you do, you have to get a conditional use permit. They discourage that. So they're allowing, uh, because of the housing crisis, they're allow allowing conversion of garage spaces uh, through a retrofit. So they're getting uh, the incentive for the developer is you get more units, you get a building that now is brought up to a higher code, uh, and they tack on that uh, a specific, or a, I think it's a 10-year period of time where there's a bit of a rent control for that particular unit so you can actually uh, uh, you know, have a, a, a fill a market need. Um, not all cities can do that. And we've been struggling here in the North Bay, I will tell you, and I'm on my way to a housing um, uh, panel, um, and it was mentioned Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa desperately wants to build taller buildings, but it's really uh, prohibitively expensive to go above a certain level because you have to change the type of uh, construction, and you can't get the rents here that you can in San Francisco and other areas. And that's been, the, that's been the dilemma, is trying to find a way to uh, push uh, developers to go into that direction um, and make it work financially. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on the insurance question, but I also want to say as a former general contractor, the retrofit is really worthwhile to do that. Um, in fact, I recommended a lot of my clients don't bother with insurance, just do the retrofit, and you're probably better off at the end. Advice for the architect from the general contractor? <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet there wasn't any engineers in that building in Sausalito, probably. <laughs> All architects, no. <laughs> On the insurance side, though, what I wanted to follow up on, since we're talking about risk, is 
that we all identify the real risk of earthquake, floods, winds, fires, all those things. But I think an emerging risk, and maybe CSAC could help with this, is that the risk of being unable to insure all these other risks. And what I mean is that I'm seeing clients that their fire insurance is being canceled unable to find any others. I had a client call me yesterday and said that they were happy to get a renewal, but it was double. It went from twelve dollars to $25,000 because of their location. And I think that that's the bigger issue is from an economic uh, stability point of view for all of us is how is California going to figure out this dilemma about how to insure all these risks? Because I think it's ridiculous that you have to buy separate earthquake insurance, separate flood insurance. I think we need to figure it all out, put it all in a package, and maybe even self-insure at some point with a, a maximum limit where we insure after $10 billion or something to protect the state. But I hopefully um, CSAC can, can take some leadership on that because I think it's a real risk. Um, real estate agents are telling me they're not closing deals and deals are falling apart already because they can't get homeowner's insurance. Thank you. The, uh, th th that was a problem that uh, um, New Orleans uh, area residents uh, in experienced after uh, Katrina because many people didn't have the right kind of insurance uh, product necessary for the kind of damage that they incurred. And so uh, uh, I think that's a really important issue. Um, I, I was just thinking back to our earlier uh, part of the discussion and you were talking about epicenters and um, I, I went through the Loma Prieta earthquake. That was one of the first disasters I worked. And um, my wife was from Santa Cruz, and she found it particularly frustrating that all the communication was uh, centering on San Francisco. But if you understand the way the media works, they, the farther out you go from where a disaster occurs, the, national, the regional and national media will try and use a point of reference that is more recognizable to their, uh, um, to their viewership in the case of TV. And so Loma Prieta is not particularly uh, a uh, um, remarkable community, uh, even for those of us from the Bay Area. And uh, I was uh, mentioning to, to you, James, that uh, um, a lot of people uh, don't really know that the 1906 earthquake, the epicenter was Santa Rosa. Um, but Santa Rosa was not particularly uh, uh, very inhabited at the time of the earthquake, and so San Francisco, suffering the largest amount of damage, uh, was, uh, um, you know, the, the, the logical point of reference for the rest of the country with respect to that disaster. That's actually a great, great point. Um, you know, everyone talks about these very large earthquakes, regional earthquakes that will affect, affect very large areas. But um, I'd also like to point out that even a local earthquake could have significant impacts on a community. And Santa Cruz being one of them in Loma Prieta, no one thinks of Santa Cruz as being impacted or remembers it unless you're from that area. But their downtown was hammered after that earthquake. They had a lot of old infrastructure, a lot of brick buildings. And for you know a decade after that earthquake, they're vacant lots, there probably still are vacant lots in Santa Cruz and Watsonville mm -hmm. that have not been rebuilt. I just wanted to point out that if we're talking about disaster anniversaries. Um, October 2nd, 1969 is the 50, was the 50th anniversary of what we call the Santa Rosa earthquakes. Um, fairly small earthquakes from a seismologist's point of view, only a maximum magnitude of 5.7, um, but they just happen to be right under the city of Santa Rosa. And at the time, the city of Santa Rosa had a lot of vulnerable old infrastructure, brick buildings, a lot of them were damaged. And Santa Rosa, you know, had to readjust their development plans. You know, they had a redevelopment plan in progress. A lot of that was stimulated by that earthquake. Um, had long-lasting impacts and, and changes in downtown Santa Rosa. And if you're interested in it, um, the U.S. Just, just released a fact sheet maybe a month or two ago about the Santa Rosa earthquakes in memory of the 50th anniversary. It's U.S. Geological Survey fact sheet 2019-3035, and it talks about some of the geology and the unique conditions of Santa Rosa that amplified shaking in that earth and then some of the longer in term impacts in terms of how Santa Rosa approached the recovery to their downtown core. 
The response takeaway on the, uh, uh, the epicenter issue is it can be particularly frustrating to um, uh, constituents that are impacted by the event that there's a disconnect between the epicenter and the communication systems that fail during an earthquake. And that was particularly significant uh, where Santa Cruz was cut off. Now, we've got a lot more communications infrastructure now, um, but that uh, just kind of underscores the importance of having uh, command of that uh, um, communication profile and those mes that messaging uh, during the event. Sydney Lewis, uh, just wanted to introduce, thank you for coming today. Uh, Sydney's with uh, the office of uh, Senator Harris. Um, anything you want to say real quickly? I just want to say thanks for having me here and um, obviously our office has been really aware of all the problems, um, especially with fires in recent years, but also tsunamis in the north coast, earthquakes all across California. Um, I actually have friends that were in Ridgecrest for that um, earthquake and they actually ended up coming back up here because a bunch of property got destroyed. So, um, you know, our team is working really hard to make sure that we're able to provide resources um, for any cities counties, um, constituents that may need it after a disaster, but if there's anything that comes to mind for you um, or anything that you see that needs to be addressed but that our office isn't currently working on, please feel free to always reach out to our staff because we want to make sure that we're the best resource possible for you guys. I want to thank you and the Senator um, during our disasters and subsequent ones. A um, lot of great help, not only on key legislation, but also just clarity. I mean, one of the things that we dealt with was um, at the height of uh, drama, uh, real drama, not just perceived around ICE uh, enforcement and other things, we had uh, the vast majority of our undocumented community not going to shelters. It'd be very real, right? Um, why would I go somewhere where the system is? And even your office came out with, uh, you know, uh, clear guidance and even letters from the ICE director saying, you know, there's not going to be an a busts during this time. I mean, we're trying to take care of people. You know, it's all these things that you have to deal with that you never thought you would have to deal with. Uh, any final questions uh, regarding earthquakes to Tim? Uh, Tim, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.